when the plat is recorded. But it's city owned property and initially the city will be the one that basically controls it. At some point, if more than 50% of the properties are sold and developed, there's the opportunity for the ownership to basically dissolve those CCNRs and then it just uh, falls back to the zoning, which would be like city zoning. And that's what, you know, like the request is tonight. So even after that, it isn't like a free for all per se, but it, uh, there's other stipulations like you have with CCNRs that come about, but in terms of the use and all of that, it'll be pretty much what we have in our zoning code. So who, what happens, I'm who, sorry. Inf who enforces the, the, the restriction? We would until there's a point at which the CCNRs would be done away with. Jody, here's something in our packet. It says okay. parcels may be used. This is more specific. Yeah. Parcels may be used only for the following offices, office showrooms, office warehouses, assembling, processing, light manufacturing, wholesaling, research and development, <clears throat> distribution, and other commercial and light industrial uses compatible with the foregoing uses. Um, prohibited uses, Resi uh, residential, salvage yards, junkyards, garbage transfers, hotels, motels, extraction of refining petroleum, anything with the odor or fumes, stockyards or animal rendering facilities. Thank God. It's got a long list. These yeah. are things that are not included. They're not allowed. Are yeah. not allowed. They're not allowed. Quarry, cement batch, vehicle or tire recycling, storage unit facilities, standalone outdoor storage, uh, storage, handling treatment or disposable hazard or, or toxic waste. Well, we're, we're, back to, I'm concerned about who's going to enforce it, like you said, because we already have people going 55 miles an hour up north Midwest. Midwest. Enforcement. Hold on. Okay. I just okay. Saw, I'm, I'm learning as we go to. <laughs> okay. The covenants, conditions, and restrictions, uses, and privileges of this declaration shall run with the land and be binding upon the in your. That's a new word for me. What does that mean? I N U R E. Upon the in year to the benefit of the city and each owner, the respective heirs, successors, and legal Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, does that mean initially it would be the city, and then after that it would be so kind of like an HOA situation, but for for the, the owners? Yeah, because it'll function like an HOA with us being the the say this I should say the city, and it's technically the and the, the Guthrie Public oh, Works yeah. Authority. So this is not inside the city limit. I'm yes, assuming. It yes, is. it is. And city and it's, it's, it's just everything it's around its county. Limits. Yeah. The last time we went and tried to, they yes. wanted to zone us all the way to 105 and. Right, because because the the speaker's correct that you know all the properties around it to the north, to the south, and to right. the east are all in the county. As you go to the west, really, it's just Caddy Corner to the okay. ODOT yard. That's where the city limits are, and, and that's then it, the only piece. Right, because yeah. even even across Midwest Boulevard to the north, there in that on the on the <laughs> west side, it, that's all county. Right. So this is just a little chunk of city yeah. that's in the county. So that's why I was saying earlier, yeah, there's no zoning and she's correct that you know the roads around there and other stuff there obviously is not city services because it's not in the city limits and it, and it will not be it is this that parcel will be the city limits. Yeah. this parcel will be that's no it has been for years questions. yeah there's just no development on it oh, yeah but your house is not oh no right? not because absolutely no right because they just it, took that little 11 yeah. acre because actually most of the roads I think are still in the county. The the southern part of the parcel on college, and, and don't hold me to this, I'd have to look up. I believe a portion of that or that may be in the city when they annexed it, the college. But Northwest Boulevard I don't believe is in the in the city. Just where the highway department is. Right. That little kind of that notch. Little yes. Piece, yes. And then That's correct. Do you remember where the winery used to be, Joe? Right. The, cross, the, the winery. Across the road. This is across the road from the winery. Right. Yeah. That right. Feathers yeah. wine. And, and, and this is also where they were looking possibly to do the sports complex. Yeah. And then that kind of didn't work out. 
in that. And, and I will say too, I probably should have said it in my staff report, a lot of this uh, is also, is the city council has made uh, the industrial park in creating a shovel ready industrial park a priority. That was one of the priorities they had at their retreat last year. So obviously as staff, oh. we're starting to move this stuff forward to get to that point. Obviously the first part of this is to get the zoning and some of the preliminary plat and all that taken care of. And then after that, you start the infrastructure part in, in that part. So anyway, just a little so bit more background. Is, yeah. I, I'm gonna read this because I need some clarification. Um, the provisions that are set forth here and for the park are intended for the park to be professionally designed, fully developed and created for business and industry. Its purpose is to provide industrial and development areas that are regulated with uniform standards for the benefit of all parties locating in the park. Management, the park shall be managed by the trustees of authority of the Guthrie Economic Development Authority. That's the part I remembered reading. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Well, that's why I said technically the funding and all of this is coming uh, through the city's uh, public works authority. And so they technically are going to be the trustees of the authority in that all, it's basically the city council, if you want to say, because right. like every week, you know, when we, we have a Guthrie Public Works Authority meeting and then we have a regular city council meeting. With a lot of the financing that we have for different projects in the community, it has to go through the Guthrie Public Works Authority side of things, not just the regular city side, so and to speak. The, and the trustees of authority shall have responsibility for enforcement of the regulations and any other duty required to maintain the park in the manner described within the regulation. Yes. Which is legally. So, so the property me. owner is the city, it, so the city is pretty yeah, much in so control. Yeah, so it's the city yeah. and the city, city council. Pretty much in control. Until yeah. everything's sold. And then they're not. Right. At that point, there is the opportunity for the, basically the CC and R's to be, uh, if you want to say, done away with in that at a certain part of ownership. But even at that point, the functionality, the uses and that will fall to the zoning, which is I-1. And as I indicated before, the... Uh, prohibited uses as well as the permitted uses in the CCNRs are almost uh, exactly what's in our zoning code. So even without CCNRs, a lot of what is not allowed or would be allowed could still just be allowed under the zoning. I'm, I'm trying to be very positive here. You all don't know how hard this is for me. Um, I understand why I think you all want to rezone it and that it's for revenue. You know, my concern is how much is ever going to be enough? How much what? Revenue. You know, tax revenue. Never. Because the city will get it. I will not get any of it. Never. Any of us that live up north of Midwest Boulevard will not get any of the revenue. Are you going to be in the zoning part or are you still outside the zone? I'm still outside, but I'm across the street. I'm saying, no, but they ADU. haven't told you that they're going to zone you into the city, right? Absolutely. They've tried it on That's numerous That's what I'm saying. Stations. They have not this time. Absolutely, they have tried it on numerous occasions. Okay. But let me go on, shall I? Um, my also concern is if you're going to rezone now, what are you going to rezone in another 10 years when a casino, God forbid, wants to come in? And none of you all were there 10 years ago when we went through this. And I'm not, I'm just being honest, probably in the next 10 years you won't be on the zoning committee either, or this committee. So even if you can say to me, well, I promise that'll never happen, I'll believe you. A casino I wants you, to come I wouldn't here. promise that. <laughs> Did you see that? The governor announced that a casino's coming to yes, Logan County? Yes, yes. Yeah. And my, this is a side note, but do you see the Supreme Court rule today that Eastern Oklahoma is mm -hmm. still tribal land? And Tulsa is not part of Oklahoma, yeah. is it? It's yeah, you know, what's to happen if they come back and say, oh no, you all don't own this, this is tribal land, we can do anything we want there. I just am not too optimistic about any of this. So, anyway, and why this land? I know the city owns other land, south, all other directions. Why do you want that land that's been there since the land run with no houses on it, with, you know, you couldn't, they couldn't, I don't mean you, but it could, you couldn't get it rezoned the first time and the second time. Why now? 
Uh, the only thing I can say is I honestly don't know that it ever was to be rezoned. There was obviously annexations that were attempted in and around that area. Yes, there was. Oh, okay, could have been. That could have been. Okay, no, and, and it, um, you know. You, Dan, this this uh, comprehensive plan map, it, yes. shows, it shows an industrial park on this site, and that right. was, was that done in 2002? That is correct. So at that point in time, this site was identified. Yes, it's been as, for a long time a... a I've, heard, a I've heard it called that before. Yeah. yeah is this it, the same property that they were talking about putting a school at one time? Too? I never heard that, but we were yeah. outside the city limits. That we don't the get about it. We don't get the what? any information. The ball parks and stuff? Yeah, that's why I was saying yeah, most recently it was talked about possibly for the ball fields, but due to the economics of it in that it what they... or looking at other alternatives for the softball, baseball, because it would have cost too much to put it there in that. But uh, like I said, I don't remember when the city had ownership of it, but it was always looked at for industrial use, because as, as Commissioner Bryan had indicated, even in the comprehensive plan that was done in 2002, it was still designated for industrial and industrial park use back in that time. Is this, uh, is this zoning the same as the I, the the business industrial park out south on division. Yeah, just before you get to industrial, that. Yeah, all that area is I one. Yeah, uh, that's all I one. And like auto quip, like where auto quip is off of industrial, they're I one. But yeah, closer back. But even even that area that's right off of division and industrial, that's all I one. Yes. So what happens if uh, a facility like AutoQuip builds out there? And I can tell you, I personally know AutoQuip is running second and occasionally third shifts. Mm -hmm. We don't get a vote in that either. You know, because we're not in the city limits and we do not want to be. But I just think it's grossly unfair that you zone that in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we moved out there because we wanted away from city interference. We wanted away from from people, although we do have people out there. But let me go on. Um, here again, put yourself in my shoes. I have been told by a real estate agent who came out and looked that if they build an industrial park out there, I, they sh to expect my property value to go down 15 to 20%. On my house alone, that is between 50 and $80,000. You are hitting me where it hurts now. That isn't even a good retirement. That's, you know, that's not fair. Um, I mean, how happy would you all be if you were told that? Not very, I think. Um, here again, I'll go back to the casino. What happens if a casino decides to build out there? I mean, are we going to have to be back here in 10 years because you all want to change the zoning again? Probably. I can bet money on it because I've lived on that land for 33 years. And this is the third one of these I've come to. This is the what? Third one of these meetings. Okay. <laughs> Zoning, accredited, you know, land grabs. Like you can call it what you want, and I'll call it what I want. Um, it's just, it's not what we want. Um, as I said, we moved up there to get away from industrial, commercial, you know, city. Although I love, I've worked in Guthrie nearly my whole life. I shop here. I love this city. I'm not moving. But I don't like being told I have to. Uh, get a permit to build a red barn that doesn't meet with you all's approval. Um, what about the animals that are out there? We have animals. I think all of us do. We have some expensive animals. I had an over $600 vet bill just today. We can't take a whole lot of more traffic going up and down those roads. Heavy traffic, noise. You know, we've got horses, we've got cattle, we've got, we've got it all out there. They spook, you know, hybrid horses and cattle you just can't you can't just treat them indiscriminately we would probably have to get rid of them just for the noise pollution alone um, I'm going to close this and give everybody else a chance I just want to simply ask you to put yourself in our shoes and understand how strongly we feel against this and I think for a meeting like this, this is a pretty darn good show of people that are opposed to this. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And before others come up to, to speak, I would have a question. 
for Dan, uh, under under county zoning, what is allowed to be built? They have none. They have none. They have county none. has no zoning. Nothing. So could somebody build anything? It's pretty much a free for all in the county. Yes. So there's nothing that would keep somebody else if they were developing it themselves from from building. It. No Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, but no, I mean the yeah, the honest answer is you're correct. Okay. Cuz cuz the county doesn't even have a building permitting process or building inspector, so even when you go to build, you don't even need to obtain a building permit. But it's okay. not county owned. It's no. no, you're right. Be, this particular parcel obviously yeah. will be in the city, so, so they have to By go, being yeah. city owned, it potentially would have more restrictions than than it still yes. being county owned. Yes, that is correct in theory. Um, yes. In theory. But I would also like to say, um, before others come up, that you know the way that cities grow and develop over time is you know there's the comprehensive plan identified certain priorities. The city council is now moving forward with priorities. Obviously, you as citizens have your priorities, and we are all individuals on this commission that have our questions, concerns, priorities, and that's that's the messiness of of this process. And you know, this is coming to us, but I want you to understand, at least for myself, that um, that that I have a lot of questions and concerns myself, and that you know, we're not all in agreement that this is our agenda, and we're marching forward with with reckless abandon so uh this is coming to us just in the same way it's coming to you as well and we're trying to gather yes, all the I input would add to the, and i would add to that we just make recommendation recommendations to the city council um question for you dan because yes. this has never happened before if the cities deny this just like anyone can, would would this go to council as the city as an entity just like a, like a you know oh yeah no just because we own it the process is no different you're right right so, so tonight I mean, you're right if tonight we voted against it the city yeah. would appeal it to council if we voted and for we'll it there. and if and if we voted for it it would go to council. Yeah, because so, uh, you're correct. It's again just because the city owns the property, the process is, is not any same. different, and and the requirements that. are not any different, right? So tonight, the planning commission will make a recommendation, and it could be a recommendation of denial. It could be a recommendation of, of of approval. Regardless of what happens, it will go to the city council. And as as Joe had indicated, when it goes to the council, they will take that recommendation into consideration, but they will have their own, if you want to say, deliberation and then make their own decision and it could be that the Planning Commission says no and the City Council says yes it could be that the Planning Commission says yes and the City Council city says, council no. says no. no every item is different and it depends but yeah tonight is not the end all for this particular item it will go to the uh, City Council and just for everybody you know since we're kind of on the subject normally when we have these applications and that it goes to the in this case like the july uh planning commission meeting and then we try to get the item to the first um, city council meeting uh, of the following month which in this case would be august 4th uh, that's when it would be on the agenda for the city council uh, the way our codes are set up and the way things are set up is the public hearing takes place here and then it goes to the council so there is no um, notification per se for the council because again the notification is for the public hearing at this point but obviously you know try to let everybody know to be transparent as possible but you would have an opportunity even at the council level if you signed up to speak on the item in that so, so when do we do that? you would do it at the council meeting yeah no, there, if you show up in person, there's uh, forms that are outside on the table and you can write on there that you would like to speak and on what item, and then that's given to the mayor before the meeting. And ten, so when those items- before the meeting. Yeah. And so when those come up, then he'll have them. And so when those items come up, he'll say, you know, Jody, uh, you signed up, would you like to speak uh, in that? So it would be the August 4th, 2020 city council. And what time? Those are at seven o'clock. A, or, I'm sorry, PM, uh, same place right here, the city council chambers. All right, let's hear from some and, more of those. And real quick, here to and speak. in between there, 
even after tonight's meeting, if you have questions or anything, you can always contact me, you know, come to my office or give me a call or whatever, be happy to talk to you and explain anything to you, give you additional information, you know, whatever may be the case. Yes, sir, if you could state your name and address for the record. Sure, uh, my name is Jared Schreider from uh, 1251 North Midwest Boulevard. <clears throat> And some of the questions I had or, or some concerns have already been answered, but uh, um, a couple of them I wanted to clarify. So is, is this city property or this property that's owned, is that actually city limits in the city limits? Yes. City limits? Yes. Okay. And, and it's kind of hard uh, if, if Aaron hears me to throw that zoning map up. Uh, on there, there's some blue lines. The blue lines indicate the city limits. And, and of course, the subject property has red around it to identify it. But that other one that's in the kind of the southwest corner there, that's the one that is the ODOT property. And so the city limits go down I-35, hit the ODOT property, and then connect to the 80 acres. And in that area, that's the only uh, parcels that are in the city limits. Okay. So, um and like she was questioning too, you know, college runs right through there. And so on one side of Midwest Boulevard, on the west side, you're in city limits with the, on the south side, but on the north side, then it would be city limits on the east side of Midwest Boulevard. Is, is that counted? Just for a little bit. Yeah, just for a little yeah. bit. But so who is in, who's maintaining those roads? Is that... You know, again, I don't want to speak uh, because I don't know with certainty because it, uh, it, I would have to honestly look because it all becomes with the annexation. Because in some cases, the roads are not necessarily annexed with the parcel. And so in some cases, they are. In some cases, it's a split where, you know, the north half is and the south half isn't. It varies on different annexations everywhere in that. So offhand, I don't know. As I indicated before, I do not believe Midwest Boulevard, other in the little intersection course or portion that goes across is in the city. The portion that is south of the city parcel along College, I believe that may be, but I know that the western part of our parcel on Midwest Boulevard is not. That's in the county. I'm just yeah, yeah. this college is, is, is patches on patches on patches. And I yeah, and, and, and the same thing, that portion of college that would be north of the ODOT property, again, I am not sure from when the annexation, where that line actually exists uh, in that. And unfortunately, there are a few of those roads we have in different places that is somewhat of an uncertainty between the county and the city. Okay. Yeah. We try to do our best to figure it out, but yeah. I just didn't know if that was kind of a, what we are going to be looking forward to with the rest of the roads you know if this were to were to go through but uh, my other question is are is the city plan on planning on annexing the rest of us in the city limits with this not at this time but I can't say that a future annexation plan might not include it but there's no immediate um, uh, plans right now. We are in the process of developing an annexation plan uh, that would look at a five to ten year period in that uh, that will maybe even by the end of this year go to the council for their review and say yes this is where we want to go. Uh, part of that plan would not have that area as a priority. It would be primarily south and in, on, and in and along the I-35 corridor as we go south. Okay, so my property does go along the I-35 corridor. To the, to the north of this to or the west. south? To the west. My property is from Midwest Boulevard. No, most of, the, most of the corridor for the I-35 would basically be south. It would be kind of, you know, where the travel center yes. is and all that, yes. south of that. Okay. Yeah. Right, like I said, right around where most of you guys are in that. I'm not saying it might not be part of the plan, but I can almost tell you that if it is part of a plan, it's going to be a last priority. Okay, because yeah. I, I will say that, you know, we, we had lived in the city and had, not, you know, in no, the I understand. city got three and we moved out there to be away so we didn't yeah. have to go get a permit to do this. And you guys are as familiar as anybody that past attempts in that area have not been successful in that and I don't believe that the uh, that has necessarily changed to where everybody was you know wants to actively get in the city right. so that's right. why no, I said I, I think that's, that's understood. That. <laughs> okay um, and then uh, in this planning do they have accommodations for the increased truck traffic? Obviously if there's manufacturing there's going to be trucks and semis and delivery trucks and all that kind of thing delivering to this to this facility all I well 
all I can say is that the roads that we have the ability to uh, upgrade will be upgraded as part of this in that. But uh, once again, I'm not necessarily saying that a lot of that could be accommodated because we don't necessarily have the maintenance ability over a lot of those roads and that, you know, obviously there will be increased traffic to what point or whatever. I don't really know because, uh, you know, that's more on the engineering side and even the traffic side. And we really haven't even got to that point uh, yet. Okay. Yeah. I just uh, was curious, you know, because there would be several points of entry that they would, could. Well, yeah, I can tell you, and, and this is the next item. Right now, there's a proposal to have two entry points to that development. One is off of Northwest Boulevard, and then there is another access that will be off a of college mm -hmm. in that. And those would be two entry points currently with the, the plat. And the plat will be the next one, and that's the one we'll discuss. But yeah, there would be two entryways, one off of Northwest Boulevard and one off of college. Okay. Yeah. No, because yeah, because it would be a coordinated effort. Because if it's not technically in the city, yeah, we don't necessarily have the authority. Yeah. Well, it could be. No, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. No, I, I understand. Well, it, it should be addressed. I mean, if 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 you're gonna if you're gonna take and develop a piece of property and you're gonna leave the infrastructure as it is. It's not fair to the people that live there at all. Yeah, in, in, in a lot of cases, uh, like I said, it'll probably be a cooperative effort where we'll say, look, you know, county, it's even your road, but because of what we have it in, we'll go ahead and have it, you know, upgraded or whatever. So it may be a cooperative effort, you know, and, and again, that happens in some other cases here and there. So, you know, that discussion will definitely happen. I just don't know the answer right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that was that was my next question: is is how is the city are going to do a better job at regulating this traffic um, for the safety of our community around there compared to the, what I call the disaster of traffic at the Love's truck truck stop that we deal with every day? They should put a stop sign right there where the truck entrance is to the to the north side of that Love's truck stop because they do not stop, they do not look. My sister was killed in that intersection three years ago. I'll yeah, and, with, and, and the only the answer time. the only answer I can give you is, you know, once again, as, as a lot of you probably know, especially when it comes to traffic control devices and that, there's manuals and unfortunately there are certain, you know, uh, criteria, if you want to say, that has to be met. Well, you know, vehicle, uh, number of vehicles per day and, and, and different elements that come. <laughs> so all I can say is it probably will meet whatever engineering traffic analysis that's necessary so I don't know if that's going to be a four-way stop you know lighted stop a combination of both I, I don't know because that's out, outside my expertise but I know all of that falls in with certain traffic uh, standards or manuals that are adopted either by a city or the state and different stuff like that well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, the expertise, they just need to talk to the people. Who live oh, and we will be. I mean, that'll be, that'll be, that'll be but there. that's why I said, unfortunately, I don't, we just don't have those answers tonight. Right. Yeah. No, and I'm just, so this can be, you know, in your mind. On sure. How this Understood. Because mm -hmm. like my wife said, you know, her sister got killed yeah. down there at 33 and, and Midwest Boulevard yeah. because of you can't see and you can't, you know, there's just, the it's terrible. The trucks don't, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and once again, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to minimize anything, but, you know, in that case, too, we're talking about state right-of-way mm -hmm. in that. And so, you know, once again, even the city in a lot of those cases has their hands tied because that's state right-of-way. So any improvements in that have to be approved by them and go through them. And it's just like as Noble goes through town, it's still technically State Highway tw uh, 33, just like Division, uh, in that is a state highway. So in some cases, our hands are somewhat tied because if ODOT says no, we can't do anything. Right. Yeah. I just, I just hate to yeah. see something happen, and then oh, I, I don't disagree. The buck to this yeah. person pass the buck to that person. It's, yeah. it's this person's fault, and because this isn't getting done, this needs to be, you know, a total. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so my last question is, and I just wanted to leave you guys with this. You know, my my wife and I moved out there, and and to enjoy the country life, the quietness. Um, we're not real far from the city, so you know we have the minis. We can shop in town. We've also invested a lot of time and money and effort into our home and our property. Uh, we changed it quite a bit in the last ten years we lived there. 
and I have talked to some real estate um, folks and some appraisers as well, and they talked about the property values. And I want to know, or you can put it in your notes to see if there's going to be a compensation package to, you know, uh, help out the people that have property that's going to lose money on it. The only thing I can tell you is in all the years I've been doing this and this subject comes up, and, and again, I'm not trying to minimize anybody's thing in, in that, but I've been, I countless hearings where that has come up. There has not been one real estate agent or anybody that could actually, cod well, I say codify because I'm used to code, but could actually put that in writing with any certainty that it was done. And I don't know of any instance in which a zoning case has created that where compensation was given to property owners. And that's not only just the state of Oklahoma, that's the entire country. And I'm sure it's probably never been done before. Yeah. And why would but, they? No, right. But that's what I'm saying is is it's it's hard to quantify that and it's hard to actually determine that. Right. Uh, I, I've told the Planning Commission I come from an area where uh, there's a lake and there's lake views and every person says my view is being taken away and I'm losing value on my property. In maybe a market type thing, that could be true, I'm not saying it's not, but it's never been actually, if you want to say put in writing or quantified to say yes, with certainty you're losing $20,000 with that use coming in. So that, like I said, that's, you well, know, I mean, two, that's that's the only thing I can answer right, with. Right, yeah. I mean, two things with that, I mean, no one's going to build an industrial park on the lake yeah. that I know of, but second of all, yeah, you, there's no way to actually prove it until it's already done, then it's too late. Your value, you put it in, the value drops. You know, and, no yeah, and, prove it ahead of time that it's going to do it. Yeah. But it's, it's looking at past experiences. That's what happens. Yeah. Um, so I guess my final final thing I just want to leave you guys something to ponder with is if you know I'm sure you guys live in the city. I don't know if you live out in the country or out in the county, but just think about it this way: If somebody came in and wanted to build a gas station right next door to your house, how would you like that? You know, bringing in extra traffic noise taken away from your your you know sense at your own home where you where you call it a sanctuary so that's all i have thank you thank you very much would anyone else like to speak please state your name and address for the record good evening my name is sherry longnecker my husband and i william longnecker moved to 1151 north midwest boulevard 17 years ago the property that's in question is directly across the street from our home we moved to that location because it was country living outside the city limits on paved roads we moved to the country for the peace and quiet away from the heavy traffic lights and noise we moved there to raise our family in a country setting and a place to raise our cattle and our horses. We're very against any complex or business being built on the property in question. We will lose our country living, our rights to shoot our guns and raise our cattle. We will be faced with more traffic, more noise, more lights, and more trash. It will bring the property value of our home down and it will raise our homeowner's insurance. It will destroy the very reason we moved there 17 years ago. It would be an infringement upon our country living and our rights. If I wanted to live with all the traffic and noise and the lights and the trash, I would have moved to the city. The intersection at College in Midwest is already very dangerous. We already have more traffic due to the new Love's truck stop, which the city did annex the Love's truck stop in and the houses to the north behind the loves. There are several um, areas that's owned by the city that are not being taken care of now. So I do not see any reason or need or expense upon the taxpayers or a burden to the community with another project. And so if you did this project, I would like to know who's gonna pay for it. I understand that you own the land and that you have the right to do as you please. I would ask you just to put yourself in our shoes. If you lived if you lived where we live, would you want this? I ask you to please consider the thoughts and the opinions of the lives that this would affect. So on behalf of the Longnecker family, um, we are against any developing in the property in question located on Midwest Boulevard. Thank you for your time and consideration. I have a, a short letter from uh, Sammy and Darlene Dawson. They live directly north, um, 
south of, of us. They've lived there for about 30 years and they were not able to attend due to health issues and they just said that they would they are against any uh, thing being built on the property uh, that's in question. They just wanted to let everybody know that they were against it. Matt, can I have a copy of that letter? From from them? From the ones that couldn't speak? Yes, or, absolutely. Or can I have that? Yeah. Or do you want a copy? Okay. No, because I'll put it as part of the record and then that gets passed on to the council. I mean, if you want, yeah. No, honestly, if you have actual written statements, I can pass those along. Honey, do you have anything to say? Yeah. But I just thought since they weren't available. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Thank you Perfect. for your time. Thank you very much. Because that'll be because then with the uh, agenda packet that I provide to the council, I can uh, also include the letters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and the same thing. If you can't tonight, just get it to me uh, about a week before the meeting. Okay. That's fine. No. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Um, I did have the one question about if if you developed it, like who who would pay for it? Because it would take a that land is is not level i mean it would take a lot has no utilities on it i was just wondering yeah, who that, would pay the for city the, yeah because the city has uh money set aside in the capital improvement program to do the infrastructure and that so it would be the city that would be paying for it obviously it would go through a bid process to get contractors and that but the actual money is uh the city Or the or the bridge that's been broken uh, by yeah, the football stadium I, for three or no, four years. And and, and that's what I, I'm saying there's different projects no, I understand. that are already that that need to be the bridge on Pine going out to the cemetery there that, that's been broken for years that there's cones that you have to go around. There's just so many different projects in the city limits that need to be addressed. I mean, how many how many years do we have to drive around the cones at the football stadium? I mean, you know how embarrassing it is when other teams come to play and we're supposed to be, you know, you know, the rock and, you know, and it's been broken for like three years. So there's just other projects I think that we should use the money towards before we before you start a, a new project. So that's that's the only thing I had to say. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Mick Arnsbrock. I live at 921 North Midwest Boulevard. How y'all doing? So I've lived at 921 for the entirety of my life. Uh, I left once for a year or two, came right back. That place is home. It was my father's home before that and his father's home before that. Uh, it's been in our family for three generations. It's peaceful, it's out of the way, and it's beautiful. And we plan on keeping it that way, which means that we don't want industrial moving next door. Uh, I'll assume that most of you haven't been out there. I'm sorry if I'm I, I have driven um, by a couple of times. Okay. I've been there. Well, it's a giant open field, just in case nobody has, with absolutely no infrastructure on it whatsoever. Uh, normally, there's 60 to 70 head of cattle out on it. Um, it's surrounded by barbed wire, and it's sandwiched between the eastern side of Midwest and Highway 33. There is no direct access to Highway 33 and I-35. Uh, the empty fields continue for a while and down Midwest with houses and property mostly on the western side of Midwest. Uh, most of those use I-35 as their back property line. That land is sloped in an east to west fashion at a somewhat significant angle. I, did, I didn't measure it, but a bit of an angle. Uh, those properties are all outside of city limits. They're all county. So there, I think there's a lot of things that people are missing when they plan on going in, when they talk about zoning it. A biggest one is I assume there'll be an environmental impact study done before anybody builds on anything. Uh, this land, every year when migratory bird season comes by, you got scissor tails nesting there. You got scissor tails hunting there. Uh, you have a ton of raptors, some of which are endangered, flying through there hunting out of those rabbits. I'm not sure if they nest there. I'm not sure if they just use it as a hunting ground. I didn't go out and look. But that may stop you right there. Uh, as mentioned, that ground slopes from east to west. I know of three bodies of water that are less than a mile away from that site that are either currently being used or have been used previously as water sources for livestock. So that <clears> runoff, uh, especially out where I'm at, and I'm sure all these guys can agree, it floods right on our property anytime it rains heavy. And that's fine. It sits there, it goes away, it goes down to the creek. But any kind of runoff is going to end up there. And any kind of industrial park is going to create runoff, especially one of the mentions was a chemical plant. So who knows what that is, you know? 
uh, I think all of us are on well water. Over time, it may take a while, but over time, that's going to get in the wells. Another issue that I see as a big deal is economical. Um, as mentioned before, there is flat out nothing infrastructure-wise on that land. Uh, there's one access point on college between Midwest and 33. Everyone's already complained about the, already complained about the road, so I'm not going to fuss anything more about it except to add that I own an F-150 and I've got to move when there's two cars on that road. So how are y'all going to expect heavy traffic to come through there? Uh, two cars just they can't fit. Um, as far as I know, there's no electrical water out there, which that alone for 77 acres to power an electric facility, which is going to be a huge burden on the electric grid. The amount of money that's going to have to go into that is not something to be overlooked. In addition, something that no one's mentioned yet, there's a pump station to the city of Coyle in the southwest corner of that property. Uh, right, I don't know what the plan is with that. I don't know who owns that, but that's almost certainly going to have to be relocated. And it's an active pump station. There's people at it two or three times a week. <clears throat> so, I mean, just consider the expense. We've all talked about the property values and things like that. Something that I'd like to add in to consider, uh, I own alpacas. Those are considered exotic animals, which is puts them in the same boot as tigers. It's hard for me to get insurance. Uh, a female proven alpaca, which, all, which means they have given birth before successfully, of show quality. All mine are, I got the paper to prove it is $10,000. I've got 14 of them. So if we do end up getting annexed, I've got to get rid of that. That's 140,000 right there. <clears throat> um, you mentioned before that the plan for the city that had always kind of thought of this as an industrial park and that was been in the plan for a while and things like that. I looked at the plan. I looked at it online. Uh, I don't know if that's the most, it's the first one you can find online that says city master plan for building and zoning, things like that. It specifically mentions that the planned growth area is to occur in the industrial park, which is near Airport Road. And if you guys don't believe me on it, look it up. It's there. It does not mention our place at all. It says specifically in there, any planned industrial growth is to go into that spot. So if we're intending on starting up a new one, are we just abandoning the old one that's already designated, that is already called an industrial park? Uh, and I mean, it's like, that just kind of gets me, you know. Uh, I get that everyone wants new jobs. I understand that and I support that. However, I got a story for you. Before I was at my current job, I worked for a staffing company. And I actually staffed part of the city of Guthrie Public Works. Streets, water, equipment operators, I hired them all. Uh, I don't know if you guys are still using that company. I've been out of it for a while. But it was about eight months ago. When we came in, there was no industrial skill set in Guthrie. I mean, working in an industry setting, machinery, chemical batching, that's not something that just anyone can do. You need to have a background in it. The city came to us and asked us to help because they couldn't find people. And we tried, and we couldn't find people. We had to go outside. We had to go to Coil. We had to go to Cushing. We had to get people to come inside the city to work for those jobs. Now, the reason behind that is, again, this is on y'all's own master plan. Most of the people in Guthrie have a commercial skill set. Uh, running a cash register, having excellent customer service, does not translate to running a press break, to doing equipment operation, to running a tool and die machine. It's just, it's not the same. So what's going to happen is we're not going to get Guthrie people jobs. We're going to end up attracting people from outside that are going to come here and work, clog up the streets, leave, spend their tax money elsewhere. Uh -huh. So rezoning and building on this plot will absolutely have to require road construction. It's just not possible without it. Uh, people constantly walk on this street all the time. I mean, it's, it's just bad news. Asking to have heavy truckloads in, especially for a warehouse setting, where now we're talking semis and 18 liters, it's just somebody's going to get hurt. Uh, something that I'd also like to mention is, because I, I guarantee you, these roads are going to need to be widened if this happens. And I can think of at least three properties that you're going to run into right away issues because of how tight it is already. You know, you're supposed to have 10 feet. We don't out there. You're going to have to take that when you get into right away either. Now you're getting into property that you have to, you know, and now we're getting into condemnation and all kinds of nonsense. And that will happen. Uh, I think that we've all learned in recent times, especially with COVID, that our economy is fragile. 
uh, economy troubles happen. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. When they do, and I think we all saw this, industrial's one of the first things to shut down. It's not the most stable that there is. Uh, this situation, it was different because it was commercial and industrial that shut down first. But anytime something goes awry, anytime that, you know, prices get high, industrial companies have the layoff, industrial companies get shut down, industrial companies cut back. They're the first ones. So let's say that everything I've said now is nonsense and we do end up with Guthrie citizens. It's not the most stable option, you know. And that's already, if we go into another situation like that, because I think we can all expect that we may get into, we're not out of the COVID woods, you know, we may come back into a four shutdown situation. Do we want to go through that after spending a ridiculous amount of money infrastructuring a empty piece of land that has no infrastructure whatsoever? Uh, we've talked about the I-35, or not the I-35, the Love's truck stop there. That was a really bad idea. Uh, that road is an S shape uphill at I'd say about a 30 degree grade and we've got semis going up it that I've seen people run off the road. I know you all have seen the traffic reports. Uh, I've complained, they mentioned that stop sign. I've complained to that city about that stop sign before and nothing ever happens. My family avoids it. We don't go that way anymore. Somebody will die there eventually. There will be a fatality there. That road is not meant for 18 wheelers and semis. So with an industrial complex, that traffic's going to increase. We're going to have to push that further out. You're going to have to decrease that grade. I don't know how much that costs, but it's just not good. Uh, you know, the biggest spot for me is just quality of life. I'm a huge fan of Guthrie. As I said, I was, I've been here 30 years almost. I left for a little bit, came right back. I like it for its pros and its cons, but it's home. It's a small town. I know Mumford made everybody want to grow up, but we're a small town, and I intend to keep it. You know, I like that way. If I wanted bigger, I'd live in Edmond. It's easier living, but it's not the type that I want. Rezoning would take a gorgeous horizon that's very quiet and serene and just destroy it. And that's why I've come back, is because why I chose to stay here, is because that's what I love about this place. Uh, it will, we will eventually become part of city limits, let's be realistic, um, and that will affect our livelihood. I think everybody here has livestock. You can't have livestock in city limits. Um, and I already told you about my alpacas. I know that Billy's got cattle. I know that everyone here has done something at some point that we can't do that anymore. Uh, we move those roads. I've mentioned before that's two homes. They're going to have to likely be relocated. I don't think you're going to be able to pull off right away without relocating the people. And that's a pretty expensive process there. Uh, I know it's been asked to you before, but I'd just like you to put yourself, not even in my shoes, but someone's shoes who was having their homes taken because I do think that's the direction we're going. And how would that make you feel? Uh, it's just a real bad idea, guys. And that's all I got. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? I think uh, we need some further discussion from our commissioners. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Well, I'll look at this as a... I like to look at it as a glass half full rather than half empty. I mean, all of you folks there in Logan County, and Logan County don't have no restriction whatsoever. If another individual would have bought five acres, 10 acres next to you, they can have an RV park, they can have a mobile home park, they can do anything they want to do with it. At least in this case, by city owning it or somehow, we have a voice to hear at least the concern. So, which is good, I mean, but at the same time, to look at it in here, I understand what are they talking about. I mean, the roads are terrible. I mean, the county uses it, to, uh, now the loves uses it, and at the same time, add an industrial, of course, you showed uh, Dan there on that park there that you have a blue line that you said it's annexed by the city, it's part of the city, which is college, right? The what? I'm it's sorry. On, on your drawing, that you have a blue line yeah. that is, as you said, it's annexed part of the city limit. The, yeah, the, the subject blue parcel. Yeah. Right, so the college is pretty much part of the city limit all the way to 33. Yeah, south of that property is all city, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the south side of that 
That's why I was saying I think the south side of the property college is city, yeah. but then the rest is not. I mean the parcel itself, but the roads are not. But that at the same time yes. there, I mean, you're just leaving it open. How many projects are we going to make off of this? What is that? Uh, I mean, what is the rush in this, and why don't we discuss it as the plan comes up? And this is already zoned agricultural, I'm assuming, right? No, it has no zoned. zoning. Oh. This is county. Mm. The county doesn't own the property past you all. It is individual owned. It's not county owned. Yeah, the, the property with. Will you throw that slide back? Aaron, could you put the the zoning map slide up? Thank you. That one, perfect. Thank you. I wish I had a laser This is the highway department. Yes, oh, right. God. that's yeah, correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this is the um, 77 acres. Correct. Right. Here, right. It's is where the water tower for Langston University. That's further back. No, that's further east. East, yeah, east, east. For, no, for east. 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 In the east corner. Right where that corner is. That's yeah. Further east. Yeah, because yeah. 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 it's not on the parcel. But all of this is all individually owned. The right. County does right. Not own it. No. But, but um, I did not say the county owned them. I said it's inside of the county, so the county, Logan County, don't have no restrictions whatsoever. You can do anything you want in Logan Look. County. I don't know why. Why can they have some kind of restrictions that you be, or as the, you know, everybody can else be more protected? But Aaron, could you put that map back up again? Thank you. The, the property south of the subject property we're talking about that runs around going east on Highway 33 on that north side there, is that city property or is that just county? No, that's a privately owned parcel in the county because the only thing the city so the owns. The south side of college is not the city. No, no, and it's not in the city limits either. Okay. Yeah. So what is that blue line you said? Right. The blue line goes around the subject parcel and then as you see the ODOT parcel, but everything oh, okay. else in and around so there the is in the county. If I were a property owner, which I sympathize with you, but if I were a property owner and me, the city, wanted to come and zone that property, for use, and I, I am for expansions. I mean, I'll tell you. But if they wanted to develop that property, College <laughs> Avenue needs to be addressed, Midwest Boulevard needs to be addressed, all of it needs to be addressed for infrastructure. And mm -hmm. if you want to develop that property, it ought to be some way to appease a homeowner that can accept some type of zoning as long as you're taken care of with your roads and your infrastructure. So it's not as dangerous as it is right now. I know the I know the land. I mean, I got a proposition. Why not zone it what it already is? Right. 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 That's I'm not up to me. Who's lived there fifty years and is in the city limits and was promised <laughs> city water, you know, trash pickup, all this. Fifty years later, she still doesn't. I mean, the way I look at it, that property is proposed to have water, sewer, and all on it anyway for, for whatever it's well. around. Understand, but I'm talking about this property like here. That. Would have would have city water, city sewer. I don't think any of us. I mean, I if 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 you want, you can, if you're going to speak, that's fine. But you need to go back to the mic because I can't pick it up on the on the audio. I don't think that I would not be opposed to it being rezoned. But industrial is not the way to do it. If, I mean, if the city needs to make money off it, if it's just got a piece of, you know, I hate to say cash in its pocket burning a hole, but land that's burning a hole in it, then rezoning for agriculture is a smarter decision. You don't have to rezone. You don't have to get in there and do infrastructure. Agriculture is going to have small production, so you may need a tractor trailer every now and then, but you're not going to run 15, 18 wheelers picking up, you know, all kinds of stuff. That's an alternative that I think you find much less opposition for. And it doesn't affect, you know, from my, I'm speaking for myself, but it's not, it doesn't affect our way of life at that point. Because with agriculture, you're not going to put it inside of city limits. It's already technically outside of city limits, so you're allowed the same freedoms that we are about what you can have, what you can grow out there. And, you know, I'd mentioned economical stability. Everybody needs food. That's not going away no matter what happens. You know, get some city employees out there, get somebody that wants to lease that land. And, I mean, there's your money. Yeah. 
I mean, I know the city bought it for a particular reason a long time ago, and you know it changes as time goes. And everything. Do you remember? Do you remember what that reason was? You know, everything finally moves to you. If you're going to grow, it's going to move to you. It was for taxes. The okay. not too long ago, they were going to sell it to ODOT. What happened? I. I don't don't. Know. And then it was being looked at it for the sports complex. Right. I yeah. don't, I'm not aware of anything that was going to be sold to ODOT. I know that it was a site that was looked at for the baseball softball complex. Right. And they actually did a uh, development plan. The problem was is the cost came to $16.5 million for the whole facility. And so at that point, it's like, well, okay, we don't have any money. So now they were looking at other alternatives for the softball, baseball. But I, I honestly, I'm not aware that of the so other thing. Was talk about the National Guard putting in a. I was at a meeting that the, you know, main haunt shows from the National Guard came up. Okay, could have been. So would the city be interested in selling it? Honestly, that I couldn't tell you. That is something, honestly, that the, Sounds like the it, city council would. Yeah, uh, depends on the outcome of, this, of yeah. this project. Yeah, yeah, no, that's honestly, that's a city council question in that, and it's kind of like with the roads and, and things like that, and the money and that, you know, that that's uh, you know discussion that you need to have, you know, at the city council or with the city council and let them know, you know, concerns and feelings, because like Joe said, that's well beyond our control to even remotely say. That that, yeah, we, we would or we wouldn't be. So, yeah. Okay. But I will say, I don't, I don't know what master plan you were looking at, but the comprehensive plan from 2000 and since 2002, this that property has been looked at as an yeah, industrial. And, and I will say that the. In, and I'm not really sure because, again, much like you, Joe, I, I don't know the exact section, but in the comprehensive plan, it did talk about basically two development areas in and around the uh, airport and then this area there. So I, I think the gentleman was correct in the sense that there is portions of our, uh, even of our comprehensive plan, because even by the land use map, if you look at it, there's a heavy concentration of industrial uh, future land use in and around the airport, but there is also the chunk where you know the subject property is and where we're talking about it so it actually designated both areas for industrial development no oh, that's fine no I, yeah any other questions comments I'll just weigh in at this point um, I am I'm in favor of uh, natural growth and development but I do have some concerns with rezoning this because a few months ago there was a small business owner that wanted to build 12 charming cabins nestled behind the trees around the lake and there was understandable concern from neighbors about the increased traffic but that was way le less of an impact to that community in that neighborhood than this would be and I think you know neighborhoods should grow when there is demand and should grow incrementally to the next increment um, but going from from large lot residential and agricultural to industrial seems like a big mm -hmm. jump and I can understand the concern. Also, budgetary concerns are really outside of the scope of the commission, but I think responsible land use and planning of and allocating of resources is, is relevant to planning. And I have concerns that if we're not able to maintain the infrastructure that we have, why are we expanding that? Um, and, and I also think that an industrial park right now, especially um, in our economy, is, is a big gamble. There are some success stories of industrial parks, but there are a lot of horror stories of putting up millions of dollars to have an empty industrial park and nobody ever you know, moves there. So I, I tend to lean towards, let's focus on the quality of life of our residents. And while you may not live in Guthrie, the Guthrie city limits, you spend your tax dollars here, you're members of the community, you go to our schools, you're uh, uh, part of the Guthrie community. So um, so th those are my comments and, and feelings at this point. But I, I, I'm in favor of business and, and growing, and yep. I think um, there may be other opportunities to have an industrial park in another part of town. Yeah. Do we have a motion? I'd like to entertain a motion at this point.
I'll make a motion not to approve it. Because it's not clear that the subject they got at 80 acres, what are you going to do? Build 80 uh, industrial barns in there? Well, there's no specification to see what is the plan. I mean, you can't have the whole 80. Are we going to just leave it open to one manufacturing? Are we going to leave it to five manufacturing? How are we going to do it? Yeah, there's a, there's a drawing. I was hmm? told 11 plots. There's a yeah, 12 11 right 11 now. Yeah. 12. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see It's that. plotted out. It, it's yeah. the next item, but roughly yeah. it's 12 right now. So it'll be about, what, eight, eight acres a piece? Or yeah. Is it surveyed on? It's the, ne the next one's the plat, but they're about four and a half acre parcels, and then there's four of them that are about, uh, about nine and a quarter acres. Theoretically, yes. Have you done any research like, do you even have the and, and, demand that's anyone no, asking for? Yeah, and, and I don't mean to, you know. If you could speak at the podium. Well, so, uh, actually, you know, we have a motion and oh, right. a second on the yeah. table. Yes. So okay. for point of right. order, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, I don't think we have enough information on it to really say, yes, let's approve it. I think it needs to be further studied and... I think the infrastructure needs to be explained to the people and how it's going to work, and it should be more community involvement in, in it since you all live out there. I mean, I've lived in the country and I've lived in the city both, so I know what it's like to live in the country. It's phenomenal. But if, if I can go back, we have a motion, but okay. there was no can second. I, can I second as the chair? Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. second. Okay. Now, if we want to have further discussion, okay. that's Thank fine. You. If not, then we can vote. Any further discussion? So we have a motion and a second to deny. deny. Right. You know, okay. I too have questions about the numbers. I think it's important for us to do the math, and um, and I would like to see a, um, some market research, especially right now, <laughs> um, about are there companies interested in relocating? I, I have my my doubts about that right now at this Me point too. in time. But it doesn't also preclude the possibility of of building an industrial a shovel ready industrial park in another part of town. Yeah. I'd like you to come sit on my front porch right before the sun goes down tomorrow night for about an hour and then come back and yeah. visual that industrial park there. Yeah, that when I drove by there, I, I, I looked at that horizon that and had the same thought. Are you trying to bribe us? <laughs> no, no, no. And, and if I could, we have a motion okay. in a second. Do we, All right. in, any further discussion? If not, I'll go with the roll vote? call vote. Okay. Okay. So uh, a yes vote is to deny. Is right. The motion and the second is to deny the, the rezone. Correct. So a yes vote would be in favor of denial. So uh, Don McBride? Yes. Joe Chappell? Let me abstain. Okay. I have property in the area. That's fine. Abe Gassenpour? <laughs> yes. And Chris Bryant? Yes. Okay. It's still the three to one because an ab abstention is the same as a no, but that's oh. a three to one. That passes. Yeah, it passes for denial. So now I bring up the uh, the thing. The next item was for the preliminary plat for the same property, but if the planning commission has recommended denial of that particular application, I don't know how prudent it would be for you guys to make a decision on a preliminary plat for a piece of property. You basically said you're not in favor yeah, of having I don't zone. Think we can do that. So at this point, I would just suggest that we, instead of denying it, just simply table it and that and move forward and see what happens through the process. And then that's something that can always be brought back at a later date. Can you just table it when they voted to deny it? No, no, there's two different things. The, the, the rezone, they have item. denial. <laughs> so, but, now, but now the next item is for the preliminary plat on that particular property. So again, it, and, and it wouldn't make any sense to approve a preliminary plat for a piece of property you just said you don't want zoned to accommodate that plat. So that's what I'm saying. So for, I guess, the best point of order in that, we'll just table that item, take no action, and again, see how the other thing goes through the process, and then that can always be brought back if... After the council. Yeah, after the council, if at some point. But like I said, it makes no sense now to simply... Because your only option really is to deny that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
Okay, so we'll table item number four, which is the preliminary plat. Which would then move us on to item number 10. All right, and so uh, what we just voted on, that will still go before council. Definitely, or, because yeah. again, you guys, uh, the Planning Commission is a recommendation body. The uh, City Council has the final say. Uh, they can take the recommendation of the Planning Commission or they could go and approve it uh, even with the Planning Commission saying no. So again, it'll be at the discretion of the Council on what they want to do. Yes. Yes. Yes, you will have the opportunity because as I said, at the Council there will be forms to fill out to where you can speak on any item on the agenda. So just get here like 10 minutes before, have that form filled out and then that's given to the Mayor. And then when that item comes up, he'll call each individual that has requested to speak. So yeah. while we are a recommending body, you know, I would hope that our recommendations do carry some weight <laughs> and all of your comments and all of our comments and our discussion is now public record and I hope that the council will consider the content of this meeting as well in, in their decision. So Joe, go use the restroom. Okay. Yes. We can go ahead and okay. start by the time I get to it. Okay. So we are now at item 10? Yes, that okay. is correct. Because like you said, we yeah. just tabled item 9 because, again, you're really yes. your only choice is denial. Okay. This is item 10, PC application 20-006, discussion and review on an amendment to the City of Guthrie Code of Ordinances, amending Chapter 16, Planning and Zoning, Article 2, Zoning, Section 1615, Adoption by Reference, Ordin Ordinance Number 2422, the Zoning Ordinance of the City, by amending and updating all articles of the City of Guthrie Zoning Code. The amendment will also repeal the existing mobile home and recreation vehicle parks, signs and awnings, landscaping and telecommunications facilities regulations in their entirety, and will update and incorporate all requirements within the updated zoning code. Staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a continuation of our uh, discussion of the updated zoning code. Uh, if you guys remember correctly, uh, at the last meeting, which was the June uh, 16th, we had, a, or June 16th, June 18th city council meeting, or city, boy, yeah. planning commission yeah. meeting, we, uh, I gave a broad overview on roughly what the uh, zoning code was going to entail, some of the uh, changes in that, and again, on a broad overview. Uh, with this meeting, I'm looking to uh, do a little bit more in depth on articles one through four, and then next Wednesday, we are gonna have another special meeting in which this will be on the agenda, and I will look to go over a little more in depth in articles five through eight, and then after that, we'll have a meeting, and, and depending on on how tonight's meeting goes and even next week's meeting goes, whether that one we would be comfortable for uh, recommendation to send to the city council or have another meeting in which, again, further discussion in that. So we'll kind of leave that up in the air. So anyway, to help kind of keep us on track and go along, I uh, did a PowerPoint in that to also help uh, uh, go with stuff. So I'll start with that. Uh, article one, uh, the in section one, in a lot of article one, as it says, is its title, citation, purpose, applicability. It's a lot, a lot of the legal stuff. And so I, uh, in, in section one, we added a title which basically says this is now going to be called the Guthrie uh, Zoning Code. Uh, section two is the purpose section. And uh, there was added wording to that to basically further explain and, and coordinate with the comprehensive plan and, and more or less say that the comprehensive plan is what sets forth our uh, uh, guidelines and policies. And so now this zoning code is the implementation aspect of, of that particular thing. So it just added some uh, wording to that. Uh, section three, applicability did not change. Uh, and then there was sections four, five, six, and seven, which actually existed in the, or exist in the current code in the way back in the administration. And they're 
really more applicable to this first part because it talks about violations and penalties, uh, vacation of public easements, repeal of conflicting ordinances. Again, a lot of the basic stuff that uh, for the most part on an everyday basis you don't uh, utilize or, or most people think about, but you need it there from a legal standpoint when uh, different things come about uh, in that. So th that pretty much takes care of uh, Article 1. Uh, so is there any questions on that? Okay, we'll move to Article 2. Article 2 is our definition section uh, in that. And once again, uh, a lot of, of uh, it, ha uh, there's not, a, 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 I want to say substantial changes, but there were definitely some changes in there. One of the things that did change, as was in, uh, indicated in the introduction, we're bringing different uh, codes that sit in the municipal code now into the zoning code. So each of those separate ordinances had definitions. Those definitions are now being moved into the actual definitions of the zoning code. So when it came to like the telecommunication towers, signs, landscaping, and RV and mobile home parks, all of those ordinances that had the definition sections now are being put in, in def, uh, section two. So that was a large part of the definition section. The next part was actually adding in and revising uh, some of the definitions. And I'll go through that a little bit so uh, everybody has an understanding of, of what we're doing uh, in that. The, the one thing, and, and I'll kind of start with, and, and that's where it talks about uh, new and combined uh, uses in, in, in the commercial land use table. Uh, one of the things that I think is uh, effective, in, and I've done this in other places, and I've seen other places do it, instead of having a land use table that has four or five pages of every use that you can possibly think of, uh, a lot of those uses get grouped into different areas. For instance, like personal services, or retail, or um, in, in particular, I can go to the one that was, um, for, um, let me see here, automobile and truck repair service stations in that. So in the definition sections, it not only has a definition, but it outlines uh, kind of uses or similar type uses that fit in that category. So you use the definition section to kind of outline a lot of the different uses versus trying to put them all in the land use table. The other thing that really helps with that is when it comes to a point where there has to be a determination made for a use that does doesn't exist in the land use table, you can use those definitions to find that compatibility and make a determination that yes, it is compatible with this particular use and that, and as such, you can now have it in whatever zoning district. So uh, that was one of the changes too, and as we go on, you'll see a reduction in the number of things that are in the land use table, and that's really a large reason why that was there. Uh, the other thing I uh, added in there was some architectural um, uh, definitions uh, such as fenestration, a definition for awning, a definition for balconies, a definition for facade, masonry material. A lot of that will now have a definition. So once again, if somebody comes in and says, "Well, what do you call my, you know, what do you call the facade?" There's an actual definition. Or the same thing. Well, what does masonry material really mean? Now there's a definition to uh, put some clarity to that and, and allow that to, uh, again, be a little bit more understood. Uh, added some uses, uh, once again, uh, that are going to be new to the land use table. Uh, there's a definition for uh, boot, brew pub. Also put the definitions in there for like a medical marijuana retail dispensary, uh, medical marijuana processing. And so some of those uses that, again, are now going to be new uses in the land use table, we have definitions for uh, distillery and, and so on. So uh, again, uh, it, it, when there is some, because the definition, you know, to kind of go back, the definition section in, in my mind is often underrated in a zoning code because it really is the area you have to go to when there's some, again, uncertainty about what a certain use really is, compatibility and all of that. The, you know, the biggest 
thing we have to go by is definitions. And so if you don't have the definitions in there, it makes it very difficult. And in more times than not, it allows the ability to, again, have uses or allow, if I, I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's often to the advantage of a business or person than it is a disadvantage in that in some cases. So anyway. Uh, and then the last thing on that is the same thing in the industrial area. Our current code, it had, I don't know, four or five pages of just all kinds of industrial type uses. One of the things that can make that much easier is to have an actual definition of what's light manufacturing and what's heavy manufacturing. And so even when we go to the industrial uh, land use table, there'll be one that says like general industrial or light manufacturing and heavy manufacturing and then in order to understand what that is we go back to the um, go back to the definition sections and now there's a pretty uh, hardy if you want to say definition of what is light manufacturing what is heavy manufacturing and it's similar to even what we were talking about in the CCNRs where it's a paragraph that you can clearly understand what is light manufacturing what is going to be heavy manufacturing and again it's a lot easier to regulate some of those uses and more importantly you don't have to think of every industrial use that may come about out and try to put it in a land use table. Uh, so that's really probably the biggest aspect. Uh, another area that we uh, that I, I changed is we had some very outdated um, definitions for mobile homes. In fact, we had like mobile home type one, two, three. It was kind of honestly some weird definitions. So that was changed to have a basic or typical uh, definition of a mobile home and what that constitutes. Uh, another thing that we uh, that I changed was once again planned unit development. Uh, it was a very outdated definition. Uh, put a new definition that to uh, basically lay out what a more modern planned unit development does and the definition and the basis of that. And so also, we're going to be amending or completely rewriting our planned unit development ordinance. So some of those definitions are being deleted because they only apply to the current code and not what the new proposed code is. And so uh, once again, uh, like I said, you can, you know, when, if you've gone through it, you'll see like retail sales. There's a laundry list of different uses that are there. And again, it makes it a lot easier to put those in the retail section rather than trying to put it in a land use table uh, in that. So with, with that, that's really the biggest changes that we have in the, in the definitions. Uh, in, in some cases, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's going to be a significant change uh, for the better. So are there any questions or anything about that? All right, we'll move right along to Article 3. Article 3 is the section that's, uh, that defines or outlines the uh, establishments of districts. So it tells us what zoning districts we have within the city of Guthrie. And there are some changes that are proposed with that. And once again, when we get to the section, it's more clearly outlined what each of those are the purpose of and intended to do. But as you'll see on here, we're adding a new zoning district called residential estate. Uh, I'll get into it later on when we go to the residential um, zoning districts, but it's basically going to be a large lot uh, zoning district. It'll be for parcels one acre and above, and it will also allow for animal privileges that currently are, don't have any allowance under our existing R1. Uh, we're adding a multifamily, uh, or what I what I call a true multifamily zoning district, and in turn, and, and I'll get to this at the next one, will be a amending the existing R2. R2 will go to a limited multifamily, which really is how it functions currently. And then the R3 will be a true multifamily where you see the highest of density of, of uh, multifamily uh, developments. And then we're adding a mixed use, which uh, will allow commercial and residential to exist either in the same building or on the same property. Uh, as we discussed earlier, it's, it, 
it's laid out into either a horizontal format or a vertical format. The horizontal means you have residential and commercial that exist on the same property but in separate buildings. Uh, a vertical is you have it in a same building. So typically you have retail on the bottom and then you have uh, residential on above floors or possibly commercial. And then finally, which wasn't in your last one, but I updated on this one, I kind of realized we don't have an actual public zoning or a public facility zoning district. Uh, most codes have that where a public building such as city hall or a fire station or even the parks or public works facility uh, even schools, anything that is publicly owned, um, will have a uh, public zoning district uh, in that. And, and there's a couple things with that that make that as, if you want to say, an advantage. Uh, Currently, even though you may have the ability to build a public facility such as, you know, like a fire station on a residential property, technically by the zoning code, you have to abide by all the dimensional standard setbacks of that zoning district. And sometimes for such things as, you know, a city hall or a fire station in that, they don't have a development pattern that is typical of residential. It's more typical of, of um, of uh, commercial because of the size, because of additional parking, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of codes will have a public facilities, which again, allows you to have a little bit more room. And I'll get into it further. Uh, ours is pretty straightforward, but again, a lot of times that's the reason you have a separate public zoning is you don't get into the, the nuances of, of other um, uh, zoning districts that don't allow for uh, compatible development. So as I indicated, the amended districts are gonna be R2. It's going from our basically multifamily to our limited multifamily. Uh, as I indicated, it currently, um, it currently uh, works as such. Uh, we don't have many, in fact, I really don't think any of our multifamily developments right now you really constitute as high density. They're more of a limited 10, 12 dwelling units per acre type development. They're not your 20, you know, some dwelling units per acre. So even though we're changing that, it's not going to have an impact on its uh, anybody having R2 to develop because it's pretty much already there with the development standards we have. And then finally with uh, industrial, honestly, I was just changing the name from to light manufacturing and wholesale rather than restricted. Uh, restricted just to me gives a wrong connotation of, of what's trying to go there. It truly is a light manufacturing type uh, zoning district. So so we just look to change the name. Everything else is pretty much gonna stay the same. There's some land uses as I talked about will come, but the biggest thing is just the name. Uh, and then finally, uh, deleted districts. Uh, as I talked, R5, our planned unit development is actually a separate zoning district. Uh, we're gonna be moving to a more traditional plan development where it acts as an overlay for any of the existing developments, whether it's C2, R1, R2, uh, that type of thing. It will not be a separate zoning district itself. And then we're also eliminating R6, which is manufactured housing. Uh, we're combining that into two, and I actually, I probably should have put it up there, into two zone, or in taking modular homes and manufacture, or modular homes, manufactured homes, or mobile homes, basically from a land use standpoint, they all act the same, and even in our code, they're pretty much regulated the same way. So it's gonna be all combined and be in the R4 district. We don't currently have any property zoned R6, and actually we don't have any property zoned R4. Uh, and that, and currently by our code, if you have a modular home, a mobile home, or any of those, it's a special use permit in any other district other than the one it's allowed or in a mobile home uh, park. Uh, and that won't change, but again, from that standpoint, as I said, we regulate it all the same way, so we just as well put it all into the same district and put it all under one. Uh, so then that pretty much takes care of, oh no, I'm sorry, the. Uh, and then uh, there was the addition of section two uh, in that. And what section two is, it's a location and interpretation of district boundaries. And this is one of those instance where is, instances is where this already happens 
but it's technically not in the code. So we're just putting it in the code. But it basically says the planning director has the ability to, if there is some uncertainty or if you want to say dispute on where the actual zoning district boundaries lie in terms of a parcel or that, uh, this section allows the planning director to make that determination that, you know, that is entirely R2 or there is a portion that isn't or whatever the case may be be. And again, a lot of that's already done, but this is again putting it in the code so there's no misunderstanding or there's no issues if it does come down to a, a legal standpoint. And as you read it, there's about five different things in that where it talks about kind of scenarios or, or that in which they, you know, there's the power to do that. So that goes into Article 3. Now comes, now we start somewhat of the fun part. Article 4. Article 4 is the zoning district and district le uh, regulations. So this is where all of these districts that were established, now we lay them out in terms of their general purpose. Uh, we start to go with the different land use tables and what's permitted, what's not permitted, and then also uh, lay out the different uh, setbacks, um, lot coverage, and, and all of that. So in the agricultural zoning districts, there is not going to be a whole lot of changes. There's a few changes to the land use table itself. Uh, once again, I had talked about where it, in our code it had mobile home type 1, mobile home type 2. Those are going to be taken out and it's simply going to say mobile manufactured home. And you'll see that throughout all our zoning districts. Uh, probably the biggest addition we have is going to be uh, the medical marijuana commercial grower. Current, and, and again, the medical marijuana area is one of those where again, what we're codifying, we already do. Uh, when the whole medical marijuana uh, came about to where it was obviously allowed to happen, the city made the determination that if you wanted to have an actual grow where you're growing the marijuana, you can do it in the ag area or you can do it inside an industrial building because by current code, those are where those can happen because you can grow crops and anything in an ag and actually you can have horticulture type uses inside an industrial building. So, and then the same with the dispensary. Uh, it went with the, well currently you can have a pharmacy or a drugstore in the commercial areas in that. And and so it was said a dispensary acts in the same manner, a typical land use. So in any of the commercial areas, you can have a, um, a, a dispensary. So uh, later on, we'll get to the actual code that lays out more of that. But again, uh, in the land use tables, it'll have medical marijuana cultivation would be a permitted use in either of the agricultural uh, zoning districts. Uh, one of the other things that was in a lot of our codes was the section that talked about utilities, communications, and all that. Basically, it was saying, you know, alley easements, it's permitted. You can put po uh, water lines, you know, in the street as a permitted use and all that. Honestly, you don't need that in a zoning code. That's pretty much, uh, you know, known. And if you have easements, you can do it regardless of the zoning district. So there's really no need to take up a bunch of land use table to put that stuff in there. It's pretty much understood through other means that that can be done. So a lot of that, again, is being eliminated because, again, it's just taking up space for no reason. And same drainage easements and that. You can put a drainage easement on any property through a recorded process. And then finally, the other thing that is being put in, in it's a section of the code that honestly, I, I still to this day couldn't figure out and that's why I wanted to amend it, is our telecommunications tower ordinance. It has a lot of, uh, uh, of regulations and standards, but it does not clearly state how somebody goes about putting a tower. It almost alludes to the fact that staff has the ability to approve it, but it doesn't clearly do that. So in that section, we're going to be doing um, not only taking out some uh, older requirements, but clearly putting forth the processes in which you will need to go through to have uh, a cell tower. In some zoning districts, there'll be permitted uses. In some districts, it'll be special use permits. In some districts, it'll be pro uh, prohibited. Essentially, in the residential areas, I think outside of multifamily, the, it'll be a prohibited use. And then as you see in the agricultural zoning, in the A1, which which is our kind of 
you know, big agriculture zoning, it will be a permitted use. Uh, and that's usually where you also have large, more, larger properties. But within the A2, which is more of the suburban district, it would be a special use permit. And then when you get to the commercial area, you'll have the same thing where I think in C2 or C3, it'll be a permitted use or in industrial. And then the rest, it'll be a special use permit. Uh, and it might even, I don't remember, I might even put it as prohibited in C1. I don't remember. But anyway, that was the other addition to this land use table. Uh, the other thing you might notice that I uh, did is kind of a reformatting of the code to where the first part will have, it'll list all of the agricultural districts in their, uh, in their, um, in their descriptions. Currently the code set up where it has A1, it has a description, and then it says for permitted uses, C table, whatever, and, and all that. And so by doing it this way, we can group them all together for descriptions, put the specific district standards, and just have our tables and be done with it. You know, it reads much easier, and for even somebody as the general public that isn't used to codes, it'll be a lot easier for them to not only find the information, but understand it and, and get a concept of that. So that was probably the biggest uh, thing that happened in, in, in uh, the code, but it didn't really change a lot of the descriptions. And so finally, on, on the dimensional standards for the, I think I had it on there, yeah, there's some changes to the dimensional standards. One of the things that throughout all our zoning districts is, to be honest with you, I think there was an over-regulation of setbacks. Because uh, not only were they fairly consistent, but you had different lot coverages for rear yards versus this, for in different setbacks for different stuff, and, and honestly, it, it makes it very com uh, confusing. Uh, we need to have a code that's a little bit more standardized where you can look and go, okay, my set setbacks are 25 front, 20 rear, 5 on the side, I'm good. And then accessory structures, you know, a little different. And, and that's what I really tried to do with all of our, our zoning uh, that, because we also had it to where you have a lot coverage, but then in the backyard you have an additional lot coverage, which to me, again, makes it somewhat unfair and restrictive for properties because you almost double the lot coverage limitations in the backyard, but that's the area in which you're going to have any development because your front yard you can't and obviously normally in the middle part of the lot you have your house and so it made it rather restrictive for accessory structures and just in general in that so basically taking that aspect out and just going to a standard lot coverage. And when we get to the residential, I'll go over that because the code does propose a slight increase in the lot coverages. But even in the um, even in the agricultural zoning district, in the A1, there currently is no lot coverage. But in the, um, in the A2, again, there was total lot, rear yard uh, in that, and so, in, in, and it was 25 and, jeez, uh, when I turn the lights off, I can't even see anything. It was 25 and 30 uh, in that, depending on whether it was a lot or the year, rear yard. What I'm proposing in there is to have a straight 35% uh, in that, which would be a little bit of an increase, but with some of these properties, honestly, our lot coverage is very restrictive uh, in that, and I'll get into that a little bit. And then the same thing, the setbacks would be standardized where you have a front side and side street and a rear yard and, and you'd be done with it. And Because we had some weird where it was like 12 feet versus nine feet in and, and that, again, and then from center line in that it was again to me rather convoluted so now it just simply would say a 25 foot setback on the front a 10 foot setback on the side the street side would be 25 and the rear yard would be 20 which is fairly close to what's there but again it's kind of standardized and you don't have to look at 10 different scenarios to try to find out what setback you had most of these setback changes, in fact, I could probably say 98% of all these setback changes will not have any impact on existing or future development because they're going to be fairly, cl fairly uh, close to what we have, or they will be the same as what we have now. Again, the only thing we're taking out is, you know, the, the 
additional stuff for rear yard in that. However, if, if the commission feels, you know, with some of that stuff it's too much or whatever, we can discuss that and, and uh, you know, put it back or move back. Again, the residential estates, or I'm sorry, the residential districts, as I indicated before, we're going to have the residential estates, which will be a new zoning district. And I'll just, I'll simply read what the uh, description says. The description says, this is a residential district to provide for rural residential, low density residential development. The district is intended to provide for large lot, single family residential development with limited animal keeping uses. And then of course the rel related red, uh, educational, recreational, etc. So and again, as I indicated, uh, this would be for one acre and above lots and it would uh, allow limited animal privileges. I'll get into that real quick here or I'll, uh, I'll get into that um, shortly. Uh, same with the, as I said again, the R2 and R3. R2 will become a limited and the R3 will become a more true multifamily. And then finally again, R4 will be a mobile home manufactured uh, home zoning district. So in those, if you have an R4 lot, then a mobile home or manufactured home would be a permitted use. If you're in any other residential zoning district, it would be a special uh, use permit as of now. And as I, you know, had said again, the R5 section you will see is completely crossed out because we're completely rewriting that and it's going to be in a separate section in Article 5. So as it sits in Article 4, it will be uh, eliminated. And the same with the R6, uh, there, uh, that whole thing on there will be eliminated because that's essentially being combined into the R4. Uh, once again, there were some changes to the land use tables. Uh, as I indicated, RE, what the section says is that you would be able to have uh, the raising, feeding, maintaining, and breeding of not more than one of the following uh, basically animals. And how it's regulated or how it would be regulated is um, it it specifically stipulates that it shall be permitted per each one half acre. So if you go down in number one, it says one horse, donkey, or mule. So that means you get one horse per half acre. So if you have an eight, one acre lot, you get two horses. If you have a two and a half acre lot, you can go up to three. And obviously you progress on. Uh, it would be the same for a cow, bull, heifer, or steer. But when it comes to like sheep or goats, some of the smaller ones, you get two per half acre. So on a one acre lot, you can have up to four goats. On one and a half, you would be able to have six and, and so on. Uh, I think this is an important part of our code because as we've spoken many times and as we've spoken with the accessory structures, we have a significant number of lots that are above one acre, but especially two, three acres, that some of them right now have a legal non-conforming status to have animals. However, if by our code somebody were to uh, get rid of those animals or if, let's say, uh, once again, you have uh, somebody that had animals, they got older, didn't want to take care of animals, quit having an animal use on their property, and then a, and, you know, a few years later sold the property, somebody coming in was, like, you know, is usually buying a two or three or four acre parcel because they want to have uh, animals, the larger shops to support it, that type of thing. Thing. Technically, by code, they couldn't because it's zoned R1. So this would give people the opportunity to, on those larger lots to rezone their property to RE and then obviously have the benefit of that zoning district for, you know, animal uses and, and, and whatnot. And, and again, I think it's important in, in, in a lot of communities you have, like us, we still have a very basic simplified zoning district thing. If you go to a lot of cities on the residential side, they'll have up to eight or ten different residential zoning districts from your large lot to your, you know, kind of medium sized lot. I mean, they'll have it to where, you know, uh, 
from 6,000 square feet, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000, 20,000 an acre, you know, they'll have a multitude of that. I think this will serve us well because it's something that is still a single family zoning. You can only have one house on it. You can't put, you know, multiple houses or have multifamily. But again, it'll open up the opportunity for people to have those animals because there are a lot that maybe want one, two, three, four horses, depending on the size of their property and that in and because uh, I've you know as we've had with the accessory structures I get a lot of calls and people are surprised that you can't have animals on some of these larger properties let alone some of the other stuff so anyway that's the current proposal in terms of how that would be figured out the the if you want to say animal units that you would be allowed and again if if the commission feels that's uh still too much uh not enough whatever that's something that uh can be discussed uh with the with the rest of the uh Zoning district standards for a lot of the other ones, those are still staying in place. Uh, as I indicated, you know, R2 acts like a uh, limited multifamily because currently what our code says is if you want to put two, uh, even in an R2, if you want to put two units on a property, you have to have a minimum of an 8,000 square foot lot. If you want to put that third unit on there, you got to have uh, 2,000 more square feet of lot. So you got to bump it up to 10,000 square feet, and so on and so on. So as you add units, you have to add acreage. And actually, that density equates to about the density that I'm proposing in there. And again, acts more like a limited multifamily in that. And then in the R3, it would be again our open ended, you know, up to 20 dwelling units per acre, high density type. Um, multifamily uh, you know I don't know how much of that we may get but it's nice to have the availability because you you know you never know because uh, like I said even uh, most all of our existing multifamily are really density wise on the limited side or what would fall in with the limited multifamily but you know even in some mixed-use developments or around some mixed-use developments we want to see that higher uh, density so when you go to the land use table, you'll see now there was an addition of agriculture animal raising. And as you will see, it is permitted under RE with the stipulations of the district regulations that I talked about, but still prohibited in every other zoning district. Uh, and the other... And then, of course, throughout the whole document, we had to add uses to RE because obviously it doesn't exist. But I will say that in the RE zone, the permitted uses or the uses that you are allowed to have outside the animal raising mimic R1 because it still is a single family residential. So most of them are still consistent with that or mimic the R1 um, uh, aspects of, of zoning because that's still what it is. Uh, I don't remember that there was any significant changes uh, in that. One of the areas that uh, was added, and again, this will come down when we get to that section in Article 5, which will be the next meeting, uh, I added an entirely new section that's called uh, Residential Short-Term Rentals. And this will regulate bed and breakfast, uh, Airbnbs, basically anything as it says that's a short-term residential uh, rental. Uh, it's broken up into about four different areas from uh, home sharing to bed and breakfast to what then is classified as a minor residential and a major residential short-term rental. And again, I'll get into that uh, and where it is or isn't allowed and, and what kind of defines both of those. But again, that had to be added to the land use table in the residential aspects, but it mimics what is in that other code section. So again, I'll go to that later. Now probably what I would say is probably the biggest change we have in, in uh, probably Probably the um, the residential aspects is in the residential we currently do not have any density set forth uh, one of the things this propo proposes is to put an actual maximum density dwelling units per acre per the zoning districts uh, so like RE you're allowed one dwelling unit on an acre obviously that's going to be your maximum density is one in the R 
one, which is our, our other single family zoning, it would come out to 7.25 dwelling units per acre. And uh, it's one of those where it, I'm sure a lot would be like, well, that's weird. What, what does that encompass, you know? Well, actually that equates to one house on a 6,000 square foot lot. So when somebody comes in even to do a subdivision, they're basically doing a density that would be one house per a 6,000 square foot lot in that, but that's what that equates to. And then as I indicated, the limited multifamily would be 12 dwelling units per acre. And again, that's fairly consistent with the development that we've had here in town with an R2. And then as I've said before, the R3 would be 20. So you could have up to 20 dwelling units per acre on the R3. And then our R4, which is our multifamily and our, uh, or not multifamily, our mobile home, manufactured home, would actually be eight dwelling units per acre. And just the way the code is set up, it would actually equate to slightly more than the R1, only because in a mobile home park, you're allowed to have a minimum of a 5,000 square foot lot versus the 6,000 we have in the R1. So that's kind of why that bumps it to the eight dwelling units per acre. Now on the lot coverage, uh, I, I, when looking over this, our lot coverages in general are very restrictive. We, and, and I, I'm not even going out on a limb to say we probably have the strictest lot coverages probably in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, generally, lot coverages in most cities and zoning codes and even on 6,000 square foot lots are usually around 35%, anywhere up to, in some cases, 50%. But 35 to 45 is a standard lot coverage for an R1. Ours is currently 25. And I will tell you, we've had difficulty uh, and, and, and I can also tell you that lot coverage probably was not always looked at when development happened because I can tell you there's a lot of homes that don't meet our current lot coverage. When they came in, the priority probably was height and setbacks. But uh, as we indicated with the accessory structures, one of the things that if you have a 6,000 square foot lot, to even put your average 14 or 1,500 square foot home on your property with the mandatory two-star garage in that you, you were basically having to reduce the square footage of your house to meet that. So in a lot of cases, to put a 1,600 square foot house, you could not. You would not meet the lot coverage. So you would theoretically have to drop the square footage down to like 300 or 1,300 square foot in order to do that. I don't think that that's, you know, again, something we really want. I, I, I don't think a, you know, average 15, 1,600 square foot house with a two-star garage and a 6,000 square foot lot is out of line. Unfortunately, the way our code lines up, it says it is. And so that's why I'm recommending we bump it up 10% to 35%, which again is still low compared to most, but it gets us to that. In fact, we had a gentleman come in who had a, a moderate sized home and he wanted to put an addition on that wasn't all that much and he was going to be at like 32 percent and we told him sorry you know we're, you're going to have to figure out another option because you exceed you know your lot coverage and so that's why i think 35 percent is going to allow the typical development that most have but again not make it to the point where we have a lot that is going to have more density or coverage that that we want uh, in that. And then same with the R2 and the R3. Again, in, in a multifamily setting in that, you will have a lot of codes that will allow up to a 60% lot coverage. The, I would say nine out of every 10 codes are at least at 50% for multifamily for R3. And so I'm proposing that to be 45 or 50%. And then again, our R2 to be 45 percent and again those are are pretty typical for multifamily uh in that and like i said there's a lot that are much greater than that but i think for the development we're going to get in one i think those are going to be fair 
to allow the development we want with again not having too much building coverage that is undesirable uh, as, as a community. And then finally in the R4 or the R, uh, what would be the R4, it'll be 45% which is kind of typical of R2. Again, it's smaller lots with that and so, you know, once again, it's, it's a little bit more than R1 just because the lots typically are going to be a little bit smaller uh, with that. So, and the other thing that I, I simplified was the basically the minimum width of the lots. One of the things that our code had is you had to have a, a minimum width for like the street, but then it's like as as you get in for what would be essentially flag lots or whatever, you had to have a certain you know measurement in in that it was kind of uh, convoluted. I just put in where we have a minimum width of, of a street, which is 50. Because currently our code says, I think you could have up to 35, but you're, where you build your house, it has to be to 50 or whatever. To me, we should just make it 50. You gotta have at least 50 feet to create a new lot. And the standard lot that we have in town for R1 is 50 by 140. It's a 7,000 square foot lot. You take two of the old ones, 50. So even as we would have new lots develop, it would make sense that we would want to have as a minimum that type of consistency rather than having some other you know if you want to say weird lots filled in with that so I just think it'll be a lot easier for a lot of those to uh, again develop to where you just put the straight minimum and be done with it uh, and again the setbacks uh, you know one of the things that uh, again that I think is is uh, a little, and, and this goes back to what we were talking before, is currently not only do you have a 25% lot coverage maximum, but then our code says, oh, in that backyard, we're basically tacking on another 20% onto that that you can't, you know, do. And once again, it becomes very restrictive to get minimum development, let alone accessory structures in that. So again, I basically eliminated that area and would just deal with an overall lot coverage. And, and that's what most codes are nowadays, is a maximum lot coverage period in that. And again, in no instance in our code is it going to allow you to put anything in the front yard. You know, you have your front setback, nothing can be built there, and then you have your house, but again, in the backyard you can have stuff. So that was uh, put... Um, reduced entirely. However, for the rear yard for accessory structures, our current code allows you to be within three feet of an alley property line for like a garage and, and that type of thing. That I did keep in there because again, I think that's important to allow a lot of times that uh, garage and that structure to be a little bit closer to the alley because again, you get separation from the primary structure and you do allow somebody to have a little bit more of a backyard, but again, uh, still have that uh, accessory structure in the rear yard uh, and the uh, and then without an alley the minimum will be 10 so you know you have to be at least 10 feet off off without an alley but if you have an alley you can get it as close as, as three feet the maximum heights are not changing I think the maximum heights are more than adequate for our community both in the residential and even in the commercial and residential uh, because as as you know even tonight was indicated, you probably aren't going to get much development be beyond a three-story building in town uh, because the economics are not there. Uh, most of them will probably be two-story uh, in that, and same with the house. You're likely not going to get anything that's more than two-story, and even in a multifamily, you know, you probably are not going to get more than a two-story. You may get a three-story, kind of like a hotel, but again, our current uh, height uh, restrictions or height limitations allow that. I don't think we're going to get much more than that, so I don't see a need to put it to 40 or 45 feet or anything like that. So the height I didn't mess with with any of the zoning districts, residential, commercial, or, or industrial. Again, if, if the commission feels that's an area that maybe we should look at some increases in that, you know, no problem, but, but again, the I think... For homes. The what? Height for homes. Or even commercial or anything. I mean, right now, you know, we're on the on the residential part, and currently in R1, it's 33 feet. You're allowed 33 feet of total height, which basically could, 
if you work it right, gets you about two and a half stories, maybe three if you got lower ceilings. But like I said, I honestly don't ever see an instance where we're going to have somebody build more than a two-story home. And most of those will probably come in around 20 feet, 25 feet. I mean, if you have some of the other ones, they might be close with the peaks of the house and that. But even, you know, some of these older um, older homes, if somebody were trying to replicate that, you can get that in 30 feet. Yeah, granted, there's some out there that might be a little taller uh, in that. But but again, if, if the commission feels we should raise that some because we want that fine but to me 33 feet in a single family area is more than adequate uh in that yes, but unless you're on five acres or something well <laughs> right no i mean to some extent you're right but like even for a house like i mean country and you want I mean, like if you're out by the lake and you want to build something with a yeah you know like for a, a lake view <laughs> like for a lake view. no that's true i mean that's why i was saying you could get in an instance where 33 feet maybe but i think overall in general that i don't be, know that if that would be rare but i would just think that yeah you wouldn't want to well you and, just wouldn't want to make it where someone couldn't have three stories if they were doing it for a view or something no right and, and that's why i was saying you know this is something again if the commission would like to see that raised to 40 feet or something or or whatever because like I said it's currently 33 yeah. in the R2 and R3 it's actually 35 or what will become the R3 I had it as 35 because that's what's currently in the R2 but again if it's something that you desire to have go higher we can uh, in that it's it's you know I think it I think it'd be good just because it should be higher the land is so get scarce well, anymore so there people yeah and and, and I guess then what the, what would you consider to be you know I guess adequate height or or you know forty eight feet forty eight I don't know I mean what are what are some well of I mean twelve that, people are jamming at twelve I mean twelve footers of things or twelve foot ceilings and three story that, fall yeah because I I mean, kind of agree with Don I I don't know if I would go over forty feet yeah I do because yeah. right now it's at thirty three if you add forty that adds seven to what we already have yeah, and okay. you know you can get a really good three story house in forty feet oh yeah yeah that's yeah. good yeah. Okay, so I'll put 40 in, in yeah. and I'm assuming we'll want to change that across the board. Because if we're going to allow it there, we just as well allow it in the multifamily as well. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So I'll, I'll make a note to mm -hmm. move to 40 or change to 40. And do you guys have any other questions or concerns like on the setbacks or lot coverage or, or anything like that? On set, setbacks? Um that's minimum, right? Correct. Now, I think we talked about the example of, of um, homes, of, of the new home on Noble that set further back than the rest. Yes. What was our discussion on that? That will be that? different because that will fall into what is the what is proposed as the Guthrie overlay or the Guthrie okay. proper overlay district. Oh, right, right. Yeah, and that one will require you to line up with your adjacent houses. Okay. And so it, it, it has that provision that basically says uh, you will need to line up with your adjacent houses or 15 feet, whichever is basically greater or, or no less than at any time 15 okay. feet. So yeah, if the two houses next to you are at 16 feet, you're going to be at 16 okay. feet. You if it's be, at 20 you feet, can't be 12. yeah, right. Yeah. If it's 20, you're going to be at 20. So yeah, that provision okay. is in there. So we do have that, if you want to say block look or all yeah. the houses line up. Because mm -hmm. you're right, up until that provision, even for that area, most codes are that way. Uh, it's a minimum setback. Mm -hmm. It isn't a you know build to line. Now you do have some commercial areas that have come about with more of your you know mixed use type development and traditional downtown development where just like our downtown it you will have a build to line. Mm -hmm. You have to build to that front front property line and have that sidewalk out front and all of that. You know obviously in our code that all exists and and that and the same thing through the and because it's it's really critical in the downtown 
that is already regulated through our H or, or uh, historic preservation ordinance and the plan or the uh, historic preservation commission. So because of that, that's basically the mechanism we have there to say no, you will build yours up to that property line to be in line with the other ones and that to have that consistency and all that. So we don't necessarily need to codify that in that because most all the other commercial development. We don't necessarily have to tell them you have a build to line. It's only critical in the downtown and like I said on the HPC side, there's that control mechanism there. But again, we didn't have that in that residential area because most all of that is not within an overlay or not within the historic district. So yeah, now that overlay will take care of it. But the same thing, if somebody has a newer subdivision in that and <coughs> you know they could build back, I don't know if we're that worried about it. I think the most critical part is along Noble and in our more historic area, not necessarily our new subdivisions in that. So that's why it's only in that area. And last time you mentioned we had some plan unit development in Guthrie. I don't know if it said R5 or yes. had, where are they? They're primarily in and around over on uh, the uh, where the uh, hotel, the the one on the hill, the Kind of as you go up, the it's is it called the territorial or not the territorial? Oh, going south. Yeah, on the south of Noble, uh, there's that one road that goes up there. I always forget what it's called. It's where kind of uh, Taco Bueno and all that. Basically, be behind Western, there it used to be Best Western and Hampton. Yeah, yeah, right behind there, in, in kind of even south of that, we have some R5 properties in there. Okay. Uh, I. Would have to look, but I'm not sure. But I bet I, I think the Powell division might be an R5. I don't remember offhand. But the majority of it are these small lots that are down there. And as I said, as I indicated before, they don't even meet our current ordinance because our current ordinance basically still required some type of sketch plan or development plan. I have nowhere have found anything to be associated with those properties. So those zoning districts that is going away, they have the opportunity to go through the revised PD ordinance to get uses uh, approved or a development plan uh, approved on that, or they would have the opportunity to rezone. In some of those, they could just as easily rezone to multifamily and accomplish the exact same thing they probably were looking at to do with the with the plan development. Development uh, in that. So, uh, but fortunately, we l literally maybe have at most a handful. So, most of those properties are, you know, we're not going to have a significant amount of properties impacted by deleting the zoning districts. But technically, by the code, they're still going to be able to develop under the R5, even though it's going away uh, in that. But there's opportunity for them. And so, that basically, um, you know, takes care of, of the residential aspects. Uh, moving on to the, the commercial part of it. Uh, whoops. Oh yeah, I already went through that. I did, I did a PowerPoint for it. Did, anyway, uh, as I indicated, the MU, and, 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 and I won't regurgitate what I've been saying, but you know, as we indicated, this will be a mixed use development that will be able to be utilized in different parts of the community. Uh, we, and what I did is another thing that I did that again kind of exists or it exists but it doesn't necessarily prohibit it or uh, that what the new code will do was clearly state that commercial how commercial and residential will work within the central business district. Right now most all the buildings you know have retail on the bottom and, and the residentials on top. But if you read our code, it doesn't necessarily mandate that. It actually allows you to have residential on the bottom if you wanted to, or even a standalone residential building. I don't think that that's what we want in our central business district because most central business districts go back to, as we talked about, you have at least retail or commercial on the bottom and then on the next floors you can have residential and or commercial. Uh, but you don't generally have residential on, on the bottom floor. Uh, in that. So that's one of the changes that will happen is it will clearly indicate that on the bottom floors of these buildings you have to have a commercial retail use and any residential will have to be on the second floor and above. I do not know any currently in the downtown that have a residential use only on the bottom. 
they're all on the second floor or not at all. So once yeah. again, I don't believe it's going to be any impact uh, to that. But like I said, that's not generally a land use that you want on your bottom floors in your downtown business district uh, in that. And then, uh, again, the rest of it is some land use changes within the table. Uh, whoops, I went the wrong way. Within the land use table. I went the wrong way. There we go. Uh, within the land use, and, and I can go over some of those. Uh, one of the, probably the biggest change, and I, and I went over this at the last one, but the biggest change we probably have is no longer the allowance of residential in a commercial district. Currently, by the way our code is set up, in our commercial land use table, it says you can have any permitted use in the R2 in a commercial area. Well, the R2 allows for single family residential. So basically our code allows for single family residential in a commercial zoning district. Once again, that's really not good land use policy because you create a lot of land use conflicts that you otherwise don't necessarily want, especially on the single family level uh, in that. And, and I, at the last meeting, I you know, talked to you guys about where you know, it's interesting that we have all these protections that commercial has to have to protect themselves from residential, but basically residential can go wherever they want, and you know, basically there's no protections for the commercial people. And so so, you know, when somebody buys a commercial property, they have or they hope to have the security that the ones around them are going to be commercial uses as well in that. But once you start allowing residential, you can have an instance where somebody has an auto body shop in a commercial zoning district and one of their neighbors comes in and puts a house there. Well, even though that commercial use has been there, you know chances are that neighbor's not going to like the noise, they're not going to like, even though they came later. So again, it just kind of eliminates a lot of these land use conflicts. So that's probably the biggest change that is happening there. Obviously, any property that currently is in, in a, you know, if there is a residence in an R1 is illegal non-conforming. We're not going to make you tear it down. You don't have to stop, go, you know, use. But again, we really have to have at some point, I feel, that that wall to say, okay, we need to move forward. Because there are some communities that will allow maybe multifamily in a commercial, but there's hardly any that will allow single family in a commercial area. Because again, it's just not good land use policy. It, 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 it adds to conflicts uh, in that. And so that's probably the biggest change that was on, on the land use table. Uh, the other area that we have is in our code, the RV parks essentially are a residential use. Generally, an RV park is your commercial or even industrial land use. It's generally not in a, com or in a residential area. They're generally in a commercial area. Now, a mobile home park, yes, they're generally residential because they're more permanent. But an RV park is more in a commercial area. So in, in this land use table now, it'll have a recreational vehicle park. It would be a special use permit in a mixed use or a C1 and it would be prohibited within the central business district, but it would be a permitted use in a C2 and a C3. And, and that's fairly typical of, of again, of, a, of an RV park. You usually have them in your general commercial or even your highway commercial type uses because that's where they, are, you know, they generally exist because you have, obviously, people who are traveling in an RV uh, in that, and so they pull into, an, and even back in the day, and still some exist, the old uh, KOA campgrounds, you know. A lot of those were right off an interstate or a main road in that for the easy access and that, you know, and so, uh, those land uses are, are going to be in that part. Uh, another land use that we don't really have any criteria to kind of regulate in that that I'm putting in and it has an open section is open storage uh, for vehicles or contractor yards or that type of thing. And there's some 
there, there's another section of the code that we'll go over in, in Article 5 that will more regulate it so we don't just get a bunch of outdoor storage. And that's the whole thing is there'll be some requirements for the screening and different stuff like that. But I think it's an important use because you do have some people who have a C2 or C3 property where they need to store, uh, you know, contractor, you know, maybe some equipment, materials, or other stuff. And so this way we have a way to regulate it rather than it just kind of popping up, you know, wherever in, in that type of thing. And then finally with that, again, we'll be adding the medical marijuana uh, dispensary, as I indicated. Uh, you know, it would be a prohib or permitted use in a C2, C3, or uh, Central, yes, yeah, central business district C2 and C3 would be a permitted use. Within a C1, it would be a special use permit and it would be prohibited within the mixed use. Uh, and then uh, also, as I indicated, I took a lot of the land uses that may have been there and put them in the definition categories, again, like retail uses. So now it says retail sales, they're permitted. But if you want to know what retail sales is, you go to the definition section and it'll have that laundry list. So those were some of the additions in there. And so I think that was probably the biggest, uh, the, uh, biggest uh, change that it probably occurred. Uh, that I can think of. Another thing I added was a brewery, restaurant, brew pub. I know that's been, you know, kind of a desire of different people. Technically in our code, it isn't allowed because uh, we didn't have a land use category for that. And so uh, this would, uh, again, allow uh, for that to, to happen. And then the Lot coverage, setbacks, and that really haven't changed. Most of our commercial areas are typical of everything. There's no lot coverage. There's no, uh, there's not any uh, um, setbacks or whatever. It's basically, you know, you provide enough separation from the building code standpoint for parking and all of that on your property. So that really isn't changing. And then finally, to wrap it up tonight, and I'm sorry we're going so long. The other hearing I didn't think would take as long. So I appreciate your standby. Uh, in the industrial, once again, probably the biggest addition is uh, taking a lot out of the land use table that, you know, uh, again, had four or five pages of every use that we would try and simplified it more to have a general light manufacturing and a general heavy manufacturing category. And again, if you go to the definition, it clearly tells you what that is going to be. Because as everybody knows, especially in the industrial side, it's hard to really try try to figure out every industrial use that's going to come about even in the future because with technology and everything else and a lot of stuff you know there's so many nuances with an industrial business and building in that it's a lot easier to have your general category so you can say yeah you fit in with the light manufacturing and so light manufacturing would be a permitted use in the I-1 and the I-2. The heavy manufacturing would only be allowed in the I-2 as a special use permit. It. So even then, there's going to be a review, which I think is important because when you start in, in a, you know, I think, uh, you know, I'll use Don as a perfect example. Uh, when you have a, a asphalt plan or an asphalt operation or a batch yard or that, uh, it's a heavy industrial use, obviously, but in a lot of cases too, it may not be a good neighbor per se where you have I-2 because unfortunately sometimes you don't always have your industrial, heavy industrial zoning in a, a I guess appropriate area. Sometimes it could be in and around your I-1. And so between uh, the light manufacturing and even some neighborhoods, it's saying, well, that property, even though it's I-2, may not be sufficient. But if you're, you know, again, I'm, you know, down in the southern part of our, our community, and even like down by uh, Seward Road or whatever, where there's a lot less density, there's larger properties and all that. Yeah, it's probably more appropriate to be there and you're closer to the interstate. So that's why 
why some of those would still be a, per, a special use permit because it allows for number one a review but number two even in some of those other instances there's the ability to attach conditions on it to make sure that it may not become an impact to you know the surrounding area in in that so that's why you know that would still be a special use permit we honestly in the city limits i don't know if we have anything that truly fits under heavy manufacturing uh in that because most everything we have fits in the i1 but again uh that that's the uh thought process behind that again if, if the commission feels differently and and said well if it's in heavy manufacturing let it be permitted then you know that's that's again that's fine uh you know we can go down that road the other thing that was added in in the definitions was again a more um a more uh, definition of manufacturing assembly. And it pretty much is what it says. It's where you truly have more of an assembly operation in that you don't even have a whole lot of manufacturing. Because uh, I know there's a lot of businesses where they take, uh, they have basically components. And all they do is take the component. They don't make the components. They don't mill the component. They don't do it. They take the components. They put it together and they have a final product and they ship it off. That's more in a, what an assembly is. And again, that would be a permitted use in an I-1 and an I-2, and I even have it to where that would be a suitable use even in a C-2 or C-3. Because again, you're not really doing any manufacturing and then you truly are doing an assembly type thing. Uh, and so pretty much that concludes tonight. That gets us through a chapter. Oh, and again, going back to the same thing, really what I did is just standardize the table in when it came to uh, the dimensional standards in that. The lot coverages and setbacks in that has not really changed uh, in that. And and I forgot, and I apologize, one last thing so I don't forget to say it and, and go over it is as i indicated at the beginning to allow for a zoning district that would be for public facilities and so what the public facilities uh, as i indicated that would be city or government or public owned property or, or buildings and the provision in there that says that the development of those properties would basically have to fall in line with a C2 uh, general commercial uh, zoning district in terms of the dimensional standards in that. And like I said, what that does is it really helps for the site development because you don't have the strong uh, setbacks in that to get what you need for parking and other stuff. So with that, I will conclude everything and we will start with Article 5 next week. As I said before, if you guys uh, come across anything, you know, after the meetings, as you continue to read over those, if there's something that comes up, make notes, ask, or say, hey, maybe we should change this. Yeah, I know we talked about it, but the more I thought about it, because again, at the end of the day, I want to have, be sure that the commission has a document that number one, they understand, but number two, Two, we're all happy with and say yeah this is going to be good and this is going to be good for the community and move forward so I've spoken plenty tonight thank you okay. and we're meeting Wednesday oh yeah I'm sorry real quick and because we do have uh, an, and if you don't mind mr. chair I'll lead right into staff comments yes yes thank you yes Wednesday we will have our next meeting uh, it was originally a special meeting to go over the zoning code however at Tuesday night's meeting at the City Council they decided to uh, have the architectural design ordinance uh, accessory structures and the um, uh, fences ordinance that came to you guys, oh, thank you, Aaron, came to you guys in March to come back because after it went to council and the committee they have, they felt that the changes were too substantial to kind of move forward, so they're bringing it back to the commission for review. Now, I will tell you what I decided to do to try to help foster some discussion and, and hopefully, again, not hang it up in too many meetings is I took what the commission originally approved, took the comments that were at the council, also took the comments that were in the in the uh, committee, and, and, and when I say even at the council, the last meeting as well, and I drafted an ordinance that I think accounts for everybody's concerns 
and and that and so I think we might have an ordinance that everybody's still going to be happy with and that but again I'll, I'll leave that up to you guys but it is also an opportunity for you guys that any aspect of that ordinance that you want to change or amend you can one last word on that I will say I sent it out today because I'm off tomorrow and it had to be posted by the end of day tomorrow so you guys will already have it in your email one of the things since we had the opportunity is I decided to break out commercial and industrial in terms of the architectural design because there still was some confusion on when the commercial uh, aspects would apply and when it would apply to industrial. So I broke that out as a separate category so now it's much clearer to say okay industrial is this and commercial is that. So you'll see that as a change uh, uh, as well but anyway that's all I have with staff comments. Thank you. Okay, and any commission comments? I would just, uh, I guess the only thing I'm going to say is that um, one of my concerns, and just for the commissioner's sake, to, to think about this a little bit and see what you think about it. But um, on the accessory buildings, um, I don't think I fully grasp the, 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 the uh, number and the square footage. Um, the um, on over an acre, you can have a detached garage and three um, accessory buildings of unlimited size, which is frightening to me personally. And then, um, and on under an acre, you can have two. Um, the largest they can be is 850 square feet, but you could have two 850 square feet ones. That I don't I don't understand that why you'd have you know 1,000 square foot. I I I just, I just have concerns about. And does lot coverage apply with yes. that? Yes, and, and, and I and real quick, I you know, and, and of course, you know, this isn't an agenda item, but real quick, uh, I, I understand Joe's concerns in that, and 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 next week, you know, we'll definitely have a discussion, and, and I think there's some, uh, there's definitely some. And I may not even understand it with lot size too. Though, no, no, but, right, but, but but the only thing I was going to say is because of lot coverage, like your average seven thousand square foot lot, I guarantee you, you are not going to get two eight hundred and fifty square foot structures on there with a moderate size home it's not possible you don't have lot coverage you don't even have lot coverage with the uh, even with the additional lot coverage we we proposed with the updated zoning code uh, in that when you start to get 10 to 15,000 square foot lots then you start to get to the point where that may become viable and then obviously after that but that is something again that is completely up for discussion and you guys can you know amend because the only, as the only reason I brought it up is because like, I wanted brains better than mine to be thinking about that <laughs> no right but but that's the thing to keep in mind though there is a lot coverage that exists you know even on an acre lot now obviously on an acre lot even with lot coverage there's still a lot of uh, footprint square footage that you have but when you get down to a 7,000 square foot po uh, property it gets very limited because your building footprint is about 1700 1750 uh, same thing I don't always do math well in my head but it's something like that or or 18, let's say even 1,800 square feet. If you put a six, you know, a, a 1,600 square foot house on there in that, and if you got 800 square feet left for that, you got 200 square feet, obviously. And there are very, you know, there are very few, uh, you know, acre lots in town, but there are some. No, right. Yeah. And, um, and and again, I have some ideas in that, and, and, and next week when we discuss that, we can go over that in that, because it is something that you guys now have the opportunity to, again, discuss, as well as change if you like, because that is part of that ordinance. So we can discuss it more uh, come Wednesday. Well, I just wanted you guys to be thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, that's why I said it technically isn't on the agenda. So, you know, as your comments, that's great, but I don't sure. want to talk too yeah, much yeah. more about it. Oh, okay. Because then we get on talking about an item that's not on the agenda. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, All right. Abe, do you have any comments? I'm good. All right. Don? I'm good. All right. Uh, I would just like to, as we move forward with this next round of revisions, uh, I watched the city council meeting this week and. Um, I I think it would be good for the Planning Commission and the Council to 
to collaborate. It, and what I think that means is we should maybe attend some of their meetings, they should maybe attend some of ours, or at least watch the meetings online because there were some obvious concerns that they had pointed out when this first round of changes reached them. And so that's why they, they um, moved forward with their subcommittee. But I'd hate for them to have to do that again with this next round of changes. Um, so hopefully we can foster some collaboration and so that we're not missing some obvious concerns that are out yeah. there. But I know that's a part of the process is we do our thing and then they do their thing. And so um, well, you may have a lot of it simplified by putting all their comments together and what we can. Yeah, and you're the, yeah. you're the in-between, too. Yeah. Like you can help facilitate <laughs> yeah. that as well. Yeah, so. no, right. Yeah. All right. So that's all I have. And uh, if there's nothing else, then we're adjourned. <laughs> Perfect.